Hi, I'm Crystal Hart, and welcome to the Crystal Hart Show. With us is Michael S. Prokop, and on our last show, we were talking about the brain, the three different parts. But first off, let me just give you Michael's uh, credentials. He is a consulting psychologist, certified clinical trauma professional, board certified PTSD clinician. He's a national speaker for the company PESI, and he also trains psychologists, counselors, and therapists. He specializes in grief and trauma uh, therapy, relaxation therapy, anger management, mind, toughness, and more. So once again, on our last show, we were talking about the brain, the three different parts. Do you want to give us just a little review uh, for, for anybody who might be just tuning in uh, to this show? And Absolutely, Crystal. Trauma impacts our brain in many different ways. And once we understand the different parts of the brain, how they work and how they can work together, we can open up and have a sense of flow again. So today... To review, there are basically three parts of the brain that you have to know about when exploring trauma. First part is the lowest part of your brain. It's right at the base of your neck. It's called the brain stem. Right back here? Yeah. It, uh -huh. it involves, it's, there's no words, there's no language in this part of the brain. It involves movement, rhythm, the initiation of movement. And it also involves your just basic uh, functionings. You, you don't have to think to breathe, do you? It just happens automatically. It's part of your autotomic nervous system. So it involves taking care of your heart rate, your pulse, uh, attunement, and attachment will be in the next part of the brain. But again, it's very, very basic. It's your basic survival reptile brain. And we'll be talking about that as we go on. So again, the reptile brain is movement, rhythm, natural breath work, blood pressure, things of that nature. And you don't have to think to do that. It just happens automatically. Second part of your brain, which is in the middle of your brain, is the limbic system. And it's often called the mammalian brain. It's your emotional brain. It involves attunement, attachment, the sense of touch, smell, and it's relationships, but there are no words in this part of the brain either. It's the human connection without words. The third part of your brain is your thinking brain at the very front. It's called your neocortex. And, uh, oftentimes, it's your, uh, and more specifically, the thinking part is the prefrontal cortex. And what happens, that's your executive functioning, sorting things out, analyzing. And when we think of the brain, we often just think of that part of the brain. But what happens when we experience a significant trauma or we're traumatized? Our thinking brain often goes offline. Do you ever hear someone who say they flipped out when they were angry? I've heard that expression. What happens is, if you look at my hand, the prefrontal cortex flips out, flips offline. So they no longer can think clearly. And we have all been there. And, and what happens is when you're traumatized, when you're angry, that part of the brain goes offline. Functional MRIs show the blood actually flowing into your limbic system, into your emotional brain, your safety system within the emotional part of your brain. And um, if you take a close look at your limbic system, your emotional brain, there's some interesting parts within that. One of the key parts within your limbic system, your emotional brain, is there's something called the amygdala. That's your warning center for safety because we're always primed and geared to take care of our safety first. Safety first. And the, the amygdala is a warning center. It's almost like a, it's almost like a smoke detector is it like, what's the fight-flight response? Okay, well, that's a very good question. What happens is the fight-flight response is something we're all born with. It's important to us. It's, 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 it's innate. We don't even have to think about it. If we're in danger, if a lion's coming toward us, we could run like heck. That would be the flight response. Or if we want to try to fight him, that would be another response. Mm -hmm. Okay? But a lot of times... The fight-flight response doesn't work. We can't flight or flee, so we end up freezing. 
and we'll be talking more about the freeze response as we go on. But right now, if you look in the back into the limbic system, the emotional brain, the amygdala, that's a, that's a little, there's actually two in your right, one in your right and one in your left hemisphere. It's about the size of your end of your little finger. And what happens is that's a smoke detector, that's your warning center. And a lot, most of it, not all of it, is through vision. So if we sense danger, our warning system goes off, the amygdala. So it's right in the middle of our brain. That system goes off and triggers the fight-flight response. So we can fight or flee. So what happens? The amygdala sends a message to the thalamus. This is getting a little complicated, but you don't have to remember all this, but just get a nice idea of what's mm -hmm. happening. And this happens automatically. As soon as you sense danger, your fight-flight response will kick in almost immediately. And what happens is the, the amygdala sends a message to the thalamus, which then sends a message to your hypothalamus, which modulates your hormones in your whole system. So, and then the hypothalamus sends a message to the pituitary gland. Okay, and, that's, and it also pumps out different hormones into your system. So let me just step back. You see danger. The amygdala goes off. The hypo, then the thalamus sends a message to the hypothalamus, and then the hypothalamus sends a message hormone to the pituitary gland. And then what happens next is um, hormones are produced in your blood, and it triggers the adrenal glands, which are above your kidneys, to produce large amounts of adrenaline? Of adrenaline we've for all energy. Heard that, we've all heard that saying, my so, adrenaline is so flowing. So this happens almost immediately. Uh, the eight, it's called the HPA axis, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis. That happens rather, very, very quickly. But the amygdala is your warning center. It sends those messages out quickly for your safety so you could either fight or flee a situation. So what happens when you go into the fight or flight response? With the HPA axis kicking in, heart rate up, blood pressure up, adrenaline pumped into your system. Cortisol is also pumped into your system, which keeps you having energy for a longer extended period of time, which can be helpful under certain situations. And so blood goes to all your major muscles. Your digestive system pretty much shut down because when you're running from a lion, you're not really thinking about lunch. You're not thinking if because if you start thinking about lunch, you're going to become lunch. Okay, <laughs> yes, that's true. You know, so it's very very important <laughs> to really understand the fight flight response. Uh -huh. So you could see it's all within. It happens instantaneously. It's so very very important. But how many times? And it's used for preservation of us, for our own personal safety, so we will not die. But how many times in your life have you actually had to use the fight-flight response to save yourself from imminent danger? So, how many times have I? Yeah, how many times have you been in imminent danger where your body kicked into fight-flight re response almost immediately, and then you were able to flee or fight for safety? Well, it has happened. Maybe a couple times? A couple times. Not, not that much. Sometimes when I was walking home in, at night, uh, you know, especially in New York at the hospital I worked at, you know, there, were, there were always sometimes moments because it would be after midnight. I'd try to yeah. take the same response. But is that, that's sort of automatic, as, as you said. Yeah, that's an automatic. But see, there, did you ever, was there anyone there that was causing danger for you? Where you had to escape? Well, you were, well, you talked a little bit I about, to get, try, try to yeah, use. so you're going to try to avoid those situations. Yeah. You want to be vigilant, but you, did you notice your body tighten up when you were walking? Oh, sure. When you so, start again, to think that some harm could come to you and you could, don't know exactly if you can, you don't know. You know, it can be overpowered if there's two or three of them and one of you. Absolutely. I mean, uh, it, but again, there is no imminent danger. So a key, as we talked about in a previous show, be vigilant in a relaxed body where you can scan and see the whole situation and not hypervision in a tight body with a racing mind. But what happens is 
we perceive a threat and we automatically kick into the fight flight response. And what happens is there's only maybe a few times in our life that we actually had to use that response. But when you're under continuous stress or feel like you're, you're locked in or you feel like there's so much pressure on you, your body is actually kicking into a fight flight response as if there's imminent danger. But a bill in front of you is not imminent danger. It is very. It can be very, very stressful. Last night I heard a sound in the, in uh, the house here in Ohio when I'm staying there, and and I sort of almost kicked into it. Luckily, I have a dog there, so <laughs> so she made me feel a little better. I don't know what she would do in the end, yeah, but so you uh, could actually, did you notice it in your body? Yeah, oh, I did. I you know I it's sort of because it's a little bit of a rough section of town and uh, not the roughest that I've ever seen, but you know. Or mm -hmm. sometimes when I've been in Africa, I'll, t I'll tell you, and, and you're sleeping in an area, and they have these sounds and sirens and beatings. Uh, I, I've, you know, yeah, that, you, that, that, you, that can be a little, and I, and I don't usually do tours, so I'm usually out there on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, and, yeah, that can present a little bit. I've, I've experienced And the key is to be aware of that. Hmm. Notice that and begin to regulate your body, relax your body with proper breathing again so you can be vigilant and scan the situation for safety and not hyper vigilant in a tight body with a racing mind. And once you're aware of that, because your body will send you a signal, your belly may tighten up, your chest may feel, hmm, that's a signal now to stop and pause and breathe. But what's the difference between intelligence? Like that, the, this sounds like it's sort of. It, it happens automatically. What's intelligence? Intelli well, you want to use your, that's in the prefrontal cortex. That's, that's your ability part. to sort things out. But what happens is when you're under high stress, when you're in fight flight, yeah, it, your thinking brain goes offline. It does. You cannot think clearly. I so, think you go into survival mode. Survival mode. Heart rate up, blood pressure up, glucose being pumped from your liver into your system for extra energy, blood to all the major muscles, thinking brain shuts down. You want to survive. That's it. And you're going to do anything you can. And you may use the fight-flight response maybe a couple times in your life. I've used it actually twice in my life. Years ago, I was a student at Kent State University. I had a lot of friends on the football team at Kent, and I was... Um, stayed for the summer. So if you know people on the football team, you can get a job where they work. So we ended up working at Rockwell, uh, I'm sorry, at Roadway Express, and we made seven times the minimum wage back then. So it was a lot of money working for Roadway. And the only one problem I had, I had to go to, from Kent to Akron, which is 15 miles. I did not have a car. The only thing I had was a motorcycle. So I went to work every day on my bike, back and forth on, on a four-lane highway. And uh, one day it's pouring down rain. Mm. I said, well, what do you do? You're a student. You don't have much money. You're making a lot of money for to pay for all of the next year's tuition. You go in the rain. Driving in on Route 76, going, through a going to Akron on my bike, weighed about 450 pounds. I hit an oil slick and some and a metal strip on the road and all of a sudden the bike went down and I found myself riding on the top of the tank as the bike was sliding straight down the highway. Okay? Are you with me so far? Yeah. Okay. I had narrowing of vision as part of flight flight where I could actually see what's happening. Everything kind of went in slow motion. I looked up the road and I saw a car coming about 150, oh. 150 feet from me. I went into complete fight flight. I actually pulled the bike up, threw it to the side of the road, and it ran off the road to safety. Now the bike weighed 450, 500 pounds. Do you think I can normally bench press 450, 500 pounds? Will you go four? And a, do you think I could bench 450 pounds? No. And Will you go 375? Do I hear <laughs> three? Uh, let's say that maybe. No, maybe. But, 152. <laughs> yeah, anyhow, absolutely not. But I went into fight the flight. The adrenaline. The adrenaline, heart rate up, blood pressure up, glucose in the system for extra energy, all the blood to the major there muscles. There are their stories. I picked it up and threw the bike to the side. And that was the fight flight response. It was beneficial to me.
when a child or something's been trapped under a un car under something that somebody's just uh, found this amount of energy to uh, to and, move and that's the that's the that, fight that's, flight response okay. so my amygdala saw danger it immediately kicked into to the uh, fight flight response the uh, the hypothalamus sent a message to the pituitary and the pituitary dropped a hormone in the bloodstream and adrenaline was pumped up from the adrenal gland. So I had massive amounts of adrenaline, massive of amounts of cortisol in my system, sugar from the liver. So I had all that extra strength I needed for say. But the question is, how many times do we actually have to go in, use the fight flight response for our safety? Not for your own survival, very, maybe a couple times for most people, but how many times do we kick in the fight flight? If you're running late, the subway's running late, you get to the office late, Add a lot, and you can feel a your lot. heart racing, and say, what can you do? Hmm, notice that, step back, pause, and take a nice belly breath. I notice even here, down. and if I'm driving, and then I try to say no, you know what, I don't care if I'm late, then I have to be late. It's not worth getting in an accident, you know, and, and, and then, I'll, then I'll really have a problem. Right now my problem's only late. Being, uh, mm -hmm. Things didn't go quite right. But, yeah. But, but you get that feeling, you know, oh, my gosh, i got to be someplace, you know. Yeah, you can feel it in your body. Uh -huh. And so you're not going to outthink that. Because remember, when your heart's racing, you're uptight, your thinking brain goes offline. So why would you want to use that part of your brain to calm down? Let's go back to our body and breathe. Slow things down. Notice what you experience in your body. So very, very important. So you can do your deep belly breathing that we talked about in a previous show. And, it, and just slow that down. And as you slow your body down through deep breathing, guess what? Your mind will become clearer again and more spacious and open up to many different possibilities. So again, the fight-flight response is very, very helpful, but how many times do we actually need it? Not very often. Okay. Now, where does trauma come in with this? So if you've been traumatized, you may feel like you're hypervigilant, you're always sensing danger around you, so you have to work on slowing your body down, slowing your system down first. Because what happens if you can't fight and you can't flee? You freeze. You shut down. You lock down. Okay? But remember, when you're in fight, flight, heart rate up, blood pressure up, glucose up in the system, adrenaline, cortisol being pumped through your system, your body is primed to fight and f fight or flee. But you can't. You're stuck. You're helpless, immobilized, and that's where trauma lies, in being helpless and immobilized and fearful for your own life. And then you, what's left? The freeze response, where you just shut down. You freeze and you may collapse. Because if you can't fight a lion, you can't flee, your body will automatically freeze and then collapse. And when you collapse and freeze, your body produces large amounts of endorphins, which are natural painkillers. So when you get pummeled by a lion or if, you get, if you're going to get beaten up by a gang, you just collapse and freeze and natural, the endorphins flow in your body so you don't feel that emotional and physical pain. So you actually, that is a natural innate response to freeze, which is so very, very important. If you look at it, and animals all have this. Do you ever notice animals, a possum would just freeze and collapse? Because they can't fight or flee, they freeze. But if you look very closely, if you watch an opossum or even animals, or say um, different animals after they freeze, they'll tend to shake. Do you ever notice that? Or put it this way, let me, let me make it even a little clearer. Do you ever see a b little bird fly into a win <coughs> window? Mm -hmm. and, and then he hits the window and he goes down. Yes. Did you ever watch him closely, what happens after? I can't say I have. Okay, well, it's kind of boring in Ohio at times. So my <laughs> dog and I, we always run outside. When a bird hits our picture window, we run outside and notice the bird. And what do we see? He, gets, he doesn't die. He's not concussed. He didn't have a concussion. He hits the window. He goes down, and he's in shock for a moment. And before he flies away, he'll shake. He'll move. 
and he'll actually do miniature flying movements. And so what he's doing is he's reproducing the movements he had before he flew away again. Before he hit the window, he's repro reproducing those movements. He's shaking that fight, fight energy out of his body. He's actually resetting his own nervous system. He's telling his amygdala, his warning center, because remember the emotional brain, the amygdala, the, the limbic system, that's nonverbal. But when he shakes, he's telling his warning center, the, the amygdala in particular, that the coast is clear. You're safe again. So when he shakes like that, he's resetting his, his little nervous system. Then he flies away. Because if he doesn't shake, his amygdala, his warning center, is going to think that the danger is still imminent. And that's how we get stuck in trauma. We don't have a chance to release that energy. So any little trigger that we may hear or see a sound or something that happened to us while we were being traumatized, we'll re-experience that as if it's here and now in the present moment because we haven't had a chance to reset our warning center, our amygdala. The, uh, the smoke detector has to be reset. And how do you do that? Through shaking and movement. Now, my son, when I was lecturing in, in Philadelphia, I got a call from my wife, and she said, Mikey, my son was hit by a car. Uh -huh. He was on his bike. He was, going to, he was going on to campus. He lived a mile off campus at Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio State University. How do you cope with that? Because I know my initial feeling is to just get so I had upset. A, I had a sinking feeling. I was in the cab. Actually, I was in Philly and I was actually just got back from the Philadelphia Museum of Art where Rocky was. We stood at the top of the steps. So I was in a really good mood, and then my wife calls. I was in the cab going back to the hotel where I was doing a two-day workshop for Pessy. And uh, my wife goes, Mikey got hit by a car. He just called me. I think he's okay. The guy who hit him wanted to take him to the hospital. And I go, no, 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 don't do that. You don't know who the fellow is. Wait for an ambulance to come. And so I, I just I noticed it in my body, and I took three deep breaths to slow down to keep my thinking brain on. And I, my wife goes, maybe see if you can get a hold of him. So I did call my son right before, as the ambulance was coming to take him to the hospital. And I said, Mikey, I want you to listen very carefully. And I said, how you? First of all, I said, how are you doing? He goes, I'm doing okay. I'm. I'm I'm just real edgy and everything. I said, well, that's okay. Be with that. I said, you may be experiencing some trembling, some shaking, some warmth, some cold, some tingling sensations in your body. And I said, if that happens, don't try to stop that. Stay with that and just let it naturally flow. Because what happens is your body is resetting its nervous system to let all that energy out of your system. If you can't fight and you can't flee, where does all that energy go? It gets locked in your body. And the longer it stays locked in your body, the higher probability of ending up with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So I said, son, make sure whatever you do, let that natural energy, it'll come and go in waves. And just stay with it and notice it. So if you've ever been, had a traumatic event, even maybe a couple weeks later, you may notice a shaking, let it happen. Don't try to stop that. So many people think, I'm going crazy, i got to stop this. And what they're doing is they're holding and locking in that trauma energy that wants to naturally release itself. So I talked to my son, he goes, if it happens, just know that. And that's how I'll try to get a hold of you after you're, you know, you're at the hospitals. So I was able to get a hold of my son that night. And he had some bad bruises, but luckily he actually landed on his head, but he had a helmet on. I always said make sure you wear a helmet. It split the helmet. That could have been his head. So always wear your seatbelt, as I mentioned in the previous show, and always wear a helmet. You say, oh, that's not cool, but you, you got to. Okay. Anyhow, I asked him, I said, did you notice anything in your body? He goes, yeah, a few times. On and off for about 40 minutes, he said he noticed a, sh a trembling, a shaking, tingling sensations in his body, a hot, some heat, some cold. And I said, beautiful. I said, what did you do? He goes, I just did what you said. I just noticed it and let it just happen. So he let his body release that trauma energy that was stuck in him. 
And that's so very, very important. Because if you can't fly, you can't fight, you can't flee, you freeze. And where does that energy go? It has to be discharged. And that's really called freeze discharge. So when the bird was shaking after he hit the window, he was discharging that trauma energy that was locked in his body. And when you discharge that energy, you're telling the, your amygdala, your warning center in the middle of your brain, hey, the coast is clear, everything's cool now, you don't have to be on guard. But if you don't do that shaking and movement, then you end up, you could end up with uh, PTSD. And, then, and that's why in therapy we spend so much time with clients doing rhythm and movement, and that's in the brain stem. Because the, after, the, if you can't fight, you can't flee, the amygdala sends a message to your brainstem, to the cerebellum in particular, which says that's where you initiate movement. And what happens is your system just shuts down to protect itself. So, Michael, we're nearing the end of our show. So, do we have a little exercise here? Yeah, what we're going to do, we're just going to simply rock back and forth and just ever, no, ever so gently notice the natural flow back and forth, just back and forth. Notice the rhythm, the movement, and even the sensations in your body as you move back and forth. We're opening up our, the lowest part of our brain, the brain stem, and just getting that movement back again. No need to hurry or rush. So we just tapped into the wisdom of our body by just simply rocking. Notice the natural flow. It's almost like a baby being rocked in a rocking chair, just back and forth. When you do that, you're actually calming your nervous system down in the lowest part of your brain, your brain stem. And with touch, the human relationship, attunement and attachment, sense of touch, we're tapping into the middle of our brain, our emotional brain. Again, no words. And then, how do you feel right now, Crystal? Calm, uh, happy, uh, sort of sedate. Okay, yeah, so you're in a nice... And, yeah, very very nice space in, in, in my head, yes. Very nice, and so you, calm body, relaxed body, calm, flowing mind, calm, happy feelings. So you can always stop and pause, especially if you're in your house or you're alone, just stop and rock back and forth and notice the movement in your body and begin to relax your system at the lowest part of your brain first. And then as you proceed, then you can tap into different parts of your brain and just notice things and analyze a little bit. But don't rush to think, just simply move first. So very, very powerful.